Peace, everybody. This is Koku. Uh, we are reading another Dr. John Henry Clark paper tonight. Um, you can't go wrong with Dr. Clark. And I like his papers a lot. This is why I gravitate to them, because they tend to be succinct, uh, but they tend to be heavy with history. And so... You know, tonight we're going to do another paper. We're going to look at uh, Toussaint Louverture. Uh, much maligned, but much respect to Toussaint all the same. Uh, we're going to read this paper tonight. Let me just share the screen so you guys can see it. Dr. John Henry Clark, Toussaint Louverture, and the Haitian Revolution. You know, the past couple of Tuesdays, we've been reading these papers about slave revolts. And I thought... This is a good way to probably wrap up this little series on slave revolts with Tucson Lopachuk. So you guys stay tuned. We're going to start the show now. And on the other side, we'll begin the reading. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. Welcome to Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people and strategies that uplift, empower and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Just want to remind you guys before we get the show rolling that this show is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. The other shows on the network you are invited to tune into. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the Revolutionary Matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. All right, and we're back. I want to thank all of you for tuning in tonight. Um, I see we got Bobby E. Wright in the chat saying, Habari Ghani. To me, I appreciate you, Bobby E. Wright. I hope, uh, I hope I make this uh, paper worth your time. I hope this paper is worth your time. And uh, if you have any comments while I'm reading, drop your comments. I'll read them live on the air. No problem. So, yeah, again, my go-to guy, Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, just writing on Toussaint show and the Haitian Revolution, I thought was a good culmination to these past few weeks when we've been reading about um, African continuity in these uh, Caribbean slave revolts. And, you know, all of those revolts, you know, uh, is what, you know, points in the direction of the Haitian Revolution, right? So let's read about the Haitian Revolution without further ado. In what is considered to be the best book on the Haitian Revolution, The Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James, the following capsule history of that revolution is given. Drop a one in the comment section if you have read The Black Jacobins and uh, add your thoughts, you know. In 1789, the French West Indian colony of San Domingo 
supplied two-thirds of the overseas trade of France and was the greatest individual market for the European slave trade. It was an integral part of the economic life of the age, the greatest colony in the world, and the pride of France and the envy of every other imperialist nation. The whole structure rested on the labor of half a million slaves. In August 1791, after two years of the French Revolution and its repercussions in San Domingo, the slaves revolted. The struggle lasted for 12 years. The slaves defeated, in turn, the local whites and the soldiers of the French monarchy, a Spanish invasion, a British expedition of some 60,000 men, and a French expedition of similar size under Bonaparte's brother-in-law. The defeat of Bonaparte's expedition in 1803 resulted in the establishment of the Negro state of Haiti, which has lasted to this day. The revolt is the only successful slave revolt in history, and the odds it had to overcome is evidence of the magnitude of the interests that were involved. The transformation of slaves trembling in hundreds before a single white man into a people able to organize themselves and defeat the most powerful European nations of their day is one of the great epics of revolutionary struggle and achievement. By the way, if you guys know of, um, if you guys know of <clears throat> uh, great resources that break down the organization around the Haitian Revolution, uh, post those as well. You know, hit me up. Let me know what you think. I just want to point out something here, too. In this first paragraph, right, you see that, you see how France was benefiting, right? The whole structure of France's benefit. Why Why we even utter the, the word France today? Why, why anyone even cares about it? The whole structure rested on the labor of half a million slaves. In other words, in other words, as long as our people participated, France benefited. And that's important to understand. I'm going to scroll back down to this last paragraph. So keep that in mind. In this last paragraph right here, he says, the transformation of slaves trembling in hundreds before a single white man into a people able to organize themselves and defeat the most powerful European nations. You see, when you don't participate, what happens? The problem is we have too much people who go along to so-called get along. And the reality of it is you ain't getting along with these folks. You have to transform yourself. The more you you wave this uh, uh, American flag. And, and the thing about this American flag, what a lot of our folks don't get is that, listen, man, America, because it destabilizes so many, especially Black equals African territories around the world, Black folks tend to have to come here. But make no mistake, no matter how many Africans they say are here in America, no matter how many Caribbeans they say are here in America, the Caribbean is still full of Caribbean people. Africa is still full of African people. So don't worry about who's here. Worry about transforming yourself. Transform yourself so, so, so that you don't remain a trembling Negro in a corner. And then this is this is all you know. This whole podcast, this whole show, the whole idea of this show is about transformation, re-Africanization. You know, curriculum. I know I don't talk about it much these days, but I'm still on that. I wish you guys would be on it too. This is the difference. If we decide, like Mr. Untouchable said on Shoot the Breeze a couple of weeks back, if we started to to, to say, you know what, I ain't playing this game no more. There has to be a shift. And you have to understand, it's your participation that keeps these nations up. It's your participation in the madness. Transform yourself. 
right? Transform yourself, for real. Let's continue. The Haitians did it. You could do it, too. Toussaint Louverture, the slave who freed Haiti, also helped indirectly to free a large part of what is now the United States from French colonial rule. So I'm going to pause here again. I tried to find the tweet earlier to put it up on the screen for this show. Didn't have enough time. But someone comes along and says the reality of the Haitian Revolution is that it expanded slavery in America. And then you have a clown-ass person like Yvette Carnell who came along and co-signed it. So now not only are you denying your, 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 your Africanness, not only are you, you sequestering yourself away from um, the rest of the African family, now you're attacking what everyone understands. Even this white boy understands this shit. Right, I, 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 while I was searching for that tweet, I, I, I saw people, you know, it, it came up. People were to, like responding to certain tweets about the Ukraine. Uh, there's some some jackass said something like, "This is the first civilized war." Or something and people said, uh, you know, the Haitian Revolution has entered the chat. Right, like this is the stuff that y'all are doing. The Haitian Revolution had, I'll be honest with y'all, I'll say this, I'll say this loudly. The Haitian Revolution is an inspiration. It wasn't perfect. By no means. And this is something if you tune into the shoot the breeze, you'd have heard us talking about this. And you could see it, you know, you could see it in the words. It was written. Haitians said, hey, we we got independence. We'll be free. You know, we got it by ourselves. We'll be free by ourselves. So it's not perfect. But if you were paying attention, you got something from it. If you could have gotten out of where you were and got to Haiti, you were free. And you got to give that respect. To continue, he rose to power during the age of revolution, talking about Tucson, and successfully led one of the great slave revolts in history. The success of the, the, success of the revolt and the drain on the French treasury caused by their attempt to suppress it was the underlying reason why Napoleon had to sell the Louisiana territory. The aftermath of this revolt rendered more certain the final prohibition of the slave trade in the United States. See, that's the thing too. Every action has a reaction. When you start to take it to your enemy, your enemy has to start to take it back to you. And what your enemy has to do is your enemy, if, if you if you have ever studied like uh, what nations do leading up to war and stuff like that, they consolidate a lot of their power, they consolidate their resources, you know, they raise taxes and whatnot. Remember, George Bush didn't raise taxes before you went into that war, and, and, and it screwed America, and then they, they had Obama come in and become the super nigga, right? Um, but that's what you do. When you start to attack, and when you stop participating, you start uh, actually attacking the system. You stand a chance, and we've seen this many times, you stand a chance of running this system in the ground just by putting up a resistance. Where are they getting the money to fund this stuff, etc. And we've seen it in history where whole wars, uh, battalions lost because they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't afford to 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 keep funding it. You understand? You gotta put up a resistance. You gotta put up a resistance. If you don't put up a resistance, the machine keeps going. You'll never get up from underneath that machine, if you don't put up a resistance. Rumors of the successful slave revolt in Haiti reached the United States and inspired some of the major slave revolts during the early part of the 19th century. It also prompted white Americans to enact more stringent laws against slaves, meeting to discuss their plight. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do. 
you got to make them have to think right now. Let's, let's keep it a buck right now. This system doesn't have to necessarily strategize against us. This system, this system could just coast. What are we really doing? That's bucking this system and making them have to stand upright and pay attention to what's going on. You have to put up a resistance. And again, John Henry Clark makes the point that I wish more black Americans would, would open up their, their, their eyes, their ears, their, their minds to understand like the Haitian revolution had its benefits. Yes, a lot of black Americans were inspired, right? A, a black American a family, ancestors were inspired to resist due to the Haitian revolution. To continue, the following information on the effects of the Haitian revolution on the struggle for freedom of the slaves in the United States is extracted from the proceedings of the Eighth Conference for the Study of the Negro Problem held at Atlanta University, May 26, 1903. Quote, the effect of the revolution on the religious life of the slaves was quickly felt. In 1800, South Carolina declared it shall not be lawful for any number of slaves, free Negroes, mulattoes, or mestizos, even in company with white persons, to meet together and assemble for the purpose of mental instruction or religious worship, either before the rising of the sun or after the going down of the same. And all magistrates, sheriffs, militia officers, etc., etc., are hereby vested with power, etc., for dispersing such assemblies. Right? That's them deputizing white folks. This is why you can't have a black gathering. I've talked about this many times. Right? You guys have seen this in your own lives many times. You can't have a, a black gathering without some white boy in the mix. I told you the story about this one organization in New York. I won't, I won't mention the name today. I'm in there, and they're screening this uh, documentary, I Am a, I, I, I am a Man, uh, on MLK, down there with the sanitation workers, right, shortly before he died, shortly before he was murdered. And I'm sitting there, and there's a black woman there hugged up with some Indian guy. What's he doing here? You see, I don't believe in allies. But that history, that no, that urge of these folks are always, and you know what? I can't even blame them. I can't even blame them. Because if you have a nation, you want to damn sure know what's going on. Especially if you have a, a an oppressed uh, minority population, you want to know what's going on too. But that's the history. That's why you always see these white folks coming through and black folks are, are gathering. There's a history there. There's a culture there. I see we. I see Bobby Wright typed one earlier to my question. Mister Untouchable is here. The hometown brethren, I appreciate you, Mr. Untouchable. Mr. Untouchable says, imagine if Haiti, after liberating themselves, they liberated all of the surrounding islands, Cuba, Jamaica, etc. We would have had a whole other history. And they wouldn't have been so isolated in their freedom. Right? That's absolutely correct. You know, it, it, it again, like I said, it wasn't a perfect thing. And we got to be honest about that, right? It wasn't a perf perfect thing. It, it was a little bit short-sighted on that part, and a little bit selfish too, I'm going to say it. You know, because when you read the words, the, see what happens is, and, and this is where I think Ozuli, who's from Haiti, didn't realize. And if you guys follow Shoot the Breeze, you know who I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, and if you don't follow Shoot the Breeze, you should be following Shoot the Breeze, right, on Saturday nights. But, um, but yeah, the, 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 the way the old English is so eloquent in a way, you, you kind of miss it. But my man's and them said, yo, we, who fought for us? 
we got freedom on our own. We shall be free by ourselves. That's essentially what he said. And we will not interrupt the peace of the other islands around us. Well, what peace are you talking about? You got to study that stuff. You got to study that stuff. And you, and by studying it, you don't study it to then turn around and hate on a people. No, you study it. And the reason why I've been reading these slave revolt papers too is because the, the, the key thing that ties a lot of them together is they're not perfect. Some were not as stringent as they should have been. Some were not as focused as they probably should have been. You learn from that. You learn from that. Azuliism is here, actually. He says, show me that quote. I never heard it. I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you off, off air later. I don't have time now. I'll show it to you off air. Uh, actually, let me see. Do I have it close by? Um... Uh, or oh, someone else in the chat has the has the time, has the moment right now. Pull it up for me, and and, and drop the link in um, in the chat for me, please. Right, drop the link in the chat. All right, but it, it's it's said, it's been said. Like I said, it's it's a thing that is said so. It says so eloquently that, uh, yeah, so if you look at the Haitian Declaration of Independence, it's actually up on the Duke website, I think. Uh, and you scroll down. I'll, I'll read it to you, actually. I'll read it to you. It says, we have dared to be free. Let us be thus by ourselves and for ourselves. Let us imitate the grown child. His own weight breaks the boundary that has become an obstacle to him. What people fought for us? What people wanted to gather the fruits of our labor? And what does this honorable absurdity to conquer in order to be enslaved? Enslaved? Let us leave this description for the French. They have conquered, but are no longer free. Uh, I'm going to go down a little bit more. He's, uh, what, is he, what does it say? He says, let us walk down another path. Let us imitate those people who are extending their concern into the future and dreading to leave an example of cowardice for posterity, prefer to be exterminated rather than lose their place as one of the world's free peoples. Goes on to say, uh, let us ensure, however, that a missionary spirit does not destroy our work. Let us allow our neighbors to breathe in peace. May they live quietly under the laws that they have made for themselves. And let us not, as revolutionary firebrands, declare ourselves the lawgivers of the Caribbean, nor let our glory consist in troubling the peace of the neighboring islands. Unlike that which we inhabit, theirs has not been drenched in the innocent blood of its inhabitants. They have no vengeance to claim for the authority that protects them. I could go on, but I, I think I made the point. Right. I could go on, but I think I made the point there. Right. In the chat, Bobby Wright says Koku, Dr. John Henrik Clark had a debate with Cornell West in 1987 about white allies and Negro Marxists. I, I think I've I think I've seen some of that before. Zuliism says that's a misunderstanding. I, I don't see the misunderstanding. Mr. Untouchable says, I'll look for it and have it for, sun, for Saturday. Still at work. I appreciate you tuning in. Still at work. I appreciate all you guys for being here. I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, but that's just the reality of it. Right? That's just the reality of it. Um, by 1822, the rigor of the South Carolina laws in regard to Negro meetings had abated, especially in a city like Charleston. And one of the results was the Denmark VZ plot. The plot was well laid, but the conspirators were betrayed. Less than 10 years after this plot was discovered and VC and his associates hanged, there broke out the Nat Turner insurrection in Virginia. Turner was himself a preacher. 
The Turner insurrection is so connected with the economic revolution which enthroned cotton that it marks an epoch in the history of the slave. A wave of legislation passed over the South prohibiting the slave from learning to read and write, forbidding Negroes to preach, and interfering with Negro religious meetings. Virginia declared in 1831 that neither slaves nor free Negroes might preach, nor could they attend religious services at night without permission. In North Carolina, slaves and free Negroes were forbidden to preach, exhort, or teach in any prayer meeting or other association for worship where slaves of different families were collected together on penalty of not more than 39 lashes. Maryland and Georgia had similar laws. The Mississippi law of 1831 said it is unlawful for any slave, free Negro or mulatto, to preach the gospel upon pain of, re of receiving 39 lashes upon the naked back of the presumptuous preacher. If a Negro received written permission from his master, he might preach to the Negroes in his immediate neighborhood, providing six respectable white men, owners of slaves, were present. In Alabama, the law of 1832 prohibited the assembling of more than five male slaves at any place off the plantation to which they belonged. But nothing in the act was to be considered as forbidding attendance at places of public worship held by white persons. No slave or free person of color was permitted to preach, exhort, or harangue any slave or slaves or free persons of color except in the presence of five respectable slaveholders or unless the person preaching was licensed by some regular body of professing Christians in, in the neighborhood to whose society or church the Negroes addressed properly. In the District of Columbia, the free Negroes began to leave white churches in 1831 and to assemble in their own. So th is, that what, is that what the ADOS folks are complaining about? Is ADOS complaining that because of the Haitian Revolution, of course white folks got a little more tight? So you're, you're vexed that white folks got a little tighter in how they did stuff? I guess I'm pissing off some people because the, the 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 number of concurrent views seems to have dropped to one, all right. But that's what y'all vex about. Maybe if y'all were pushing back a little harder at the time, you would have had uh, created a similar outcome. And um, please, if you're here live, hit the like button. If you're here live, hit the like button for me, please. Right? The Haitian Revolution, led by Toussaint Louverture, helped to set in motion the early Black revolt against slavery in the United States. In order to understand this, we must just understand his, hist his, his story and how the act within him. Toussaint Louverture, the hero of this story, came of a royal line. His grandfather was Gao Janu. Uh, I probably butchered that, king of the Aradas, a powerful tribe on the west coast of Africa. I didn't know that. The son was captured by a hostile tribe and sold into slavery in one of the West Indian islands, Santo Domingo. Here his son, Pierre Dominique Toussaint, better known as Toussaint Louverture, was born in 1743, a slave, but the grandson of a king. Nothing very much is known of his boyhood days except that he was very intelligent and loyal. Because of his faithfulness, he rose rapidly from the occupation of shepherd to coachman and thence to the position of foreman on the large plantation where he lived. He was always fond of reading and managed remarkably enough to become acquainted with one or two foreign languages. Certainly, he knew Latin. His tastes were various, but chiefly, he read the writings of Epictetus, uh, himself once a slave in Greece, who later became a philosopher. Isn't that a fine picture? This boy on the tropical plantation reading the works of, of one whose early life had been as his own and who later on rose to fame? Besides Epictetus, Toussaint read uh, Plutarch's uh, lives and several very technical and formative works on warfare and the conduct of battles. 
but chiefly, he liked the Frenchman Diderot's uh, history of the East and West Indies, in which Diderot, writing under the name of the Abbe Renal, said, nations of Europe, your slaves need neither your generosity nor your advice to break the sacrilegious yoke which oppresses them. They only need a chief sufficiently courageous to lead them to vengeance and slaughter. Where can this great man be found? Where is this new Spartacus? He will appear. We cannot doubt it. He will show himself to raise the sacred standard of liberty and gather around him his companions in misfortune. More impetus than the mountain torrents, they will leave behind them all sides, the in the ineffaceable signs of their great resentment. Why haven't we gotten our shit together? This man is telling you, because you see what happens here. This guy is looking at the situation, and he knows himself, no man. No human at that is going to take this wretched situation for so long. He knows that man will rise up against it at some point. The Haitians did it back in the day. We need to do it now. We need to do it now. And he's telling you all they need and then, and this is why they they cut down these leaders all the time. They only need a chief sufficiently courageous and lead them to vengeance and slaughter. You know what comes to mind when I when I hear that that last part of the sentence? Your religion tells you that vengeance is not yours. Mm. But they push that heavy on you, right? They push that heavy on you, that religion stuff that tells you vengeance is not your vengeance is 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 the Lord's, it's some abstract figure. To continue, self-confidence is a part of greatness, modesty. Is a good thing, a fine thing, but one does not get very far on that quality alone, no matter how deserving. Toussaint pouring over these words from his youth up, from his youth up, feeling more and more keenly the, the horror of his condition, finally became convinced that these words applied to him, and that he was that promised leader. Yet fifty years elapsed before he acted on this. When he was 54, he tells us, quote, since the blacks are free, they need a chief. And it is I who must be that leader predicted by the Abbey Renal. So this guy, right, this Frenchman it, it is the guy who, who inspires, had no idea it would inspire him. It's he who inspires Tucson. Let me pause here and do a quick station ID break. We'll be back on the other side. You guys drop a one if you're still here and, and you're liking what uh, Dr. John Henry Clark is putting down. If you're still here, drop a one and uh, or let that one also show uh, that you're liking the paper so far. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. 
You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. All right, we're back. Um, I also want you guys to know that if you are interested, if you've ever thought about being a, a podcaster, that um, there is space for you here on KWAZ Radio. You guys should should join if you're interested. Have you ever considered joining KWAZ Radio? Each of our hosts shares their unique perspective with you. You might have a perspective that needs to be shared. If that's true, hit us up at kwaz.radio at gmail.com. What are you going to do? What you going to do? Yes, indeed. Thanks to the matron for that. Uh, that spot, you might, you guys make sure to check out the Revolutionary Matron show, The Learning Curve. Uh, you know, make, make sure to check out The Learning Curve. Check out the Pro Black Perspectives recent episode. So, Sunday was a good time, actually. He's doing that Enemies Within. He's talking about bitch ass Negroes and fine Africanists and all that. Tune into that and check out the. Hash Rally Podcast's uh, last show uh, of, of the Presents segment. Um, you know, a good interview as well. So make sure you guys check it out. I see I got a one. I got a couple of ones, actually. Bobby Wright says, he said one. He's enjoying the paper. And he's learning some great information. I appreciate you, Bobby Wright. Marcus McGee is here. Peace to Marcus McGee. He types one. Uh, Azuliism says the Haitian constitution was rewritten. So was the so was that from the original? All right, you know what? Mr. Untouchable says he'll he'll find the document. We'll put it up for Saturday night shoot the breeze. You guys make sure to tune in. We'll have this discussion again. You know, but that's 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 documented, my friend. You know. Um let's continue with the paper. Uh, this is really a short paper, to be honest. Um, but uh, this is a short paper. But of course, we have to have some commentary in between. And you guys post your commentary too in the chat. I'll read all your comments as well. Let me read this uh, paragraph here again because I think it's important. Marcus Garvey talked about this as well. If you don't, if you don't have this self confidence, you're twice defeated in life. And I talked about this recently on one of the Thursday Thoughts segments of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. You know, that show I do over on the KWAZ Radio YouTube channel. Like, one of the problems with our people, I'm speaking generally now, is we don't have high self-esteem. We don't have a lot of self-confidence and that makes us susceptible to bullshit when you see things like miscegenation and all that stuff that's more lack of self-confidence you you feel like your proximity to whiteness and stuff pulls you up and, and and pushes you forward um when you see blacks adhering to and and and, and jingo and baby with this american flag and stuff that's and, and, and like, what, what did I see? I saw a tweet today that was so, so silly. Like, an ADOS type person is saying something like, um, you know, immigrants should go back to their country and build up their country like they've done in theirs. And I'm like, <sighs> But what that does, though, what's what what words like that does for the person who's saying it, and for some of the people reading that who agree with it, it gives them a little ego boost, it gives them a little confidence. This is why this is why I'm talking to all of you who are listening. I'm talking to all of you who are listening. Your job, your job, 
is to give an authentic Black equals African um, self-esteem and confidence boost, especially to the youth around you, but to everyone around you, man. This is where we lose. Proximity to whiteness or being a population within a white nation and that white nation is doing a lot of things doesn't necessarily reflect on you. If I move to China and China finds the cure for cancer, am I supposed to rejoice as, a, as, if, I, as if I was a Chinese person? No. No. We got to direct this, this ego and this self-esteem and this, this confidence. That's what we got to do. You know, because that's what we see Toussaint did. The island of Haiti and Santo Domingo. These two provinces formed the same island, you must remember, was in a terrible plight in those days. Fighting, misgovernment, slavery, and disaster ruled on all sides. Three powerful nations of Europe, England, France, and Spain, were warring with each other because of their interests and rebellions on the part of the slaves were constantly breaking out against their various masters. French slavery flourished most in Haiti, where conditions were unspeakable for over a century. Finally, after the outbreak of the French Revolution, the Haitians sent two delegates to Paris. One of them, uh, Auger, I, I guess, on his return, started a small rebellion, which led to much bloodshed. Now, many Black Haitians had in various ways achieved their actual freedom, but did not have the rights of freedom. In order to offset the consequences of OJ's rebellion, uh, France granted to these free Blacks all civil privileges, making them free in deed as well as in name. Immediately, a new confusion arose for the free blacks took up arms against the white owners of slave plantations and 452,000 slaves rose up to take sides with them. This was in August, 1791. Toussaint, still a foreman on his master's plantation, felt his time had come. He first held Bayou, Bayou de Libertat, the general overseer of the plantation, who had been very kind to him to escape with his wife and family. Then he enlisted in the cause of other Blacks. He was a surgeon at first, but in the general confusion, he realized that a good drill master would be of more service, and so he began to train and direct. His early reading doubtless helped him out here, but he was a natural leader, and generalship came as easily to him as breathing. He seems to have been fitted in every way for the position. Which was, which was finally his. His tastes and needs were extraordinarily simple. As a rule, his meals consisted of a few oatmeal cakes, two or three bananas, and water. That's a interesting um, detail. We got KW Dawn 7 here, saying sour bona. Piece of KW Dawn 7, right? Uh... Yeah, piece of KW on seven. But um, by the way, that 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 passage I read from the Haitian Declaration of Independence, that's from 1804. Right? That's from 1804. Um, but that's an interesting detail, right? A breakfast of a champion, right? A few oatmeal cakes, two or three bananas, and water. That's that's interesting. Uh, he never touched wine. Nothing was too strenuous or fatiguing for him. He did not know the meaning of fear. He could do without sleep and frequently went with no more than two hours of sleep a night, and he was a magnificent horseman. Then, too, he had good luck. In seven years of campaigning, he was wounded 19 times and never once seriously. I didn't notice either. He had great personal magnetism, an impressiveness and an abundance of self-confidence. I, I tell you, man, that self-confidence thing, 
is big. That self-confidence thing is big. At first, Toussaint allied himself with the Spanish, who were fighting the French. On his leadership, the black troops advanced from victory to victory. He was at this time, it was at this time, sorry, that Toussaint took on the extra name of Louverture because he believed that he was, quote unquote, the opening or door to brighter things for his fellow men. You know, there's an important lesson in that. I've talked about it uh, before. I won't get into details before. Uh, again, but there's an importance in naming things yourself. There, there really is an importance in naming things yourself. And there's an importance in naming yourself. I read that paper a little while ago by um, Obadale Campbell that was talking about, you know, we as African, you know, Black people as African people, we would take these, you know, we'll be given these names of Richard and we don't even know what Richard means, right? But when you reach a certain age, an age of reason, you have to name yourself. When you talk about, about that self-confidence, you have to, that's a part of it. You know, I, I've always had respect for folks who, who, you know, damn well their name ain't in Zynga, but they name themselves in Zynga. You know what I mean? You have to, instead of walking around here as Patricia Clark or some shit, you name yourself. And this is a this is an example right here of someone naming themselves. You have to name yourself and name the things around you, man. In spite of his many triumphs and his steady advance, he never stooped to base actions, never inflicted unnecessary cruelty or imposed punishments purely for revenge. And it was proverbial among the French, Spanish, and English that he never broke his word, right? Now, although Toussaint had taken up arms against France, his heart was really with the French. Theirs were the traditions, customs, and training that he really admired and with which he would have preferred to ally himself. This is his downfall, by the way. When, therefore, the French, hard-pressed by the British and his own troops alike, finally proclaimed the abolition of slavery in Haiti, Toussaint immediately left the Spanish and united with the French. From this stand, nothing could move him. General Maitland, head of the English forces, offered the supreme control of Haiti to, to Toussaint, and he refused. He wanted slavery abolished, but he wanted to be free under France. Now, <laughs> ah, 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 boy. You know, I read something recently that I, I kind of, I guess I forgot about it. But, you know, at one time, the Chinese were out here pushing to go back under, like, British rule and stuff. There's an inferiority complex in most people. You feel me? There's an inferiority complex in most people. The reality of it is, you, you, you want to know what, what the reality of it is? The reality of it is most people want to be ruled. Most people want to be ruled. How do you think these chiefs and you know, even in Africa, chiefs and you know, which are kings and uh, these monarchies in 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 Europe and all. Hey, it's because people want to be ruled. Your job and my job is to make sure that you have the right ruler and that you're following the right rules. We want African leadership. We want patriotic African leadership. We, 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 we might even need to consider a benevolent dictator, to quote Mr. Untouchable and others from Shoot the Breeze a couple weeks ago. You feel me? We have to understand that most of our people want to be led. And most people want to be led by a winner. 
This is how this is why we lose our folks. That's just the reality. In the chat, Mr. Untouchable says something that I like right here. He says, naming yourself causes a mental shift consciously and unconsciously. Absolutely. And, and, and make no mistake, for us in particular, giving yourself an African name is, is powerful. I, I saw a guy the other day. Let me see if I could even pull it. I, you know, I, I kind of don't even want to waste the time sharing the screen for that. I saw a guy the other day say something so wild. He was trying to diss this sister uh, named Jam. And then you, you guys know who Jam is, right? Uh, he's trying to diss this sister named Jam. And a part of what he says is like this sister Jam, who I, be who I believe is actually African-American, but she might be married to, um, you know, someone from elsewhere. This dude says she doesn't have a plantation name like Ados does. And I'm like, do you know how pathetic you are? Y'all are looking at plantation names now? There's a power in naming things. Malcolm X and the, the NOI and those guys, they understood that stuff. You guys know that interview with Malcolm X with a white boy trying to ask him, so what is your name, man? Okay, what was your father's name? And Malcolm, I mean, destroy, I mean, it's, it's smooth how he deals with that dude. My father didn't know his name either. You got to name yourself. As Mr. Untouchable says, that's a great, great way he put that. That creates a mental shift consciously and unconsciously. Bobby Wright says that proximity to whiteness. A lot of people are, are confident because of your proximity to whiteness, but look at what you've done. Mr. Untouchable says dependency is easy. Independence and freedom takes elbow grease. And that's that, that, that goes to that point I was making. Most people... They want to be. They, they want to follow someone. Let someone else make the decisions and study and and know what's the better choice. And we'll follow that. Most people want to be led. Our jobs is to is to create the the future leaders that will actually give a damn about the people they're leading, namely Black equals African people. I want to thank all you guys for the comments, man. Again, you guys are what make these live streams top tier, to be honest. Now, although Tucson had taken up arms against France, oh, I think I read this already, right? Uh, yeah, he wanted to be free under France. I mean, in fact, I'm going to read that, that, that passage again. Now, although Tucson had taken up arms against France, his heart was really with the French. There's what the traditions, customs, and training that he really admired. And, and, and this right here, by the way, this is our problem today, too. Whose customs? Whose training? Do we, do we really admire? You know? And, and, that, and, and that includes me, too. Where am I right now? Right? You go off to school, you leave your country and go off. Look, look at the Africans in, in, in the Ukraine right now. As Mr. Untouchable pointed out on Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze that just passed, make sure you guys check out that episode if you haven't already. You telling me there's no medical schools and stuff in Africa you could have gone to? But this is our problem too. Our proximity to whiteness is, is really our problem. Because we're following their traditions and customs and training. This is what Tucson had the problem with. 
When therefore the French, hard pressed by the British and his own troops alike, finally proclaimed the abolition of slavery in Haiti, Toussaint immediately left the Spanish and united with the French. From this time, nothing could move him. General Maitland, head of the English forces, right, another enemy of ours, but still, offered the supreme control of Haiti to, to uh, Tucson. He refused. He wanted slavery abolished, but he wanted to be free under France. In the chat, Zuliism says, Toussaint did what he did. Without him, we don't get the revolution. He cut their heads, though, and burned the house. Beautiful. Right? Beautiful. By 1800, Haitian affairs had begun to calm down. The Spanish and English forces withdrew, and the French, although unwillingly, also left the island, also with Toussaint as commander-in-chief of, of, of forces. He showed himself as able a ruler in peace as in war. He drew up a constitution under which Haiti was independent. He was to be governor or president for life and had the power to name his successor. There was to be religious freedom throughout the province and the ports of the island were to be thrown open to the world. He sent a draft of his constitution to France for official confirmation. That's problematic too, but like Rizzoli said, I'm going to go back to it, Toussaint did what he did without him. We don't get the revolution. He cut their heads, though, and burned the house. So again, in these last three weeks, I've been talking about these, um, you know, the African continuity through these slave revolts in the Caribbean. And like I've said, in, in each of these three weeks, they weren't all perfect. And we got to understand that, too, when we have our own revolutions, we got to look at where past revolutions, for this is why we have to study this stuff. Where did they fail? Okay, a lot of them failed because they didn't have uh, a nationalist or, or nation-building mindset. They just kind of wanted to be away from the bullshit. We had the, 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 the cases, including this one here, where the indoctrination was so strong that even in revolution, you still wanted to be led by the people you were revolting against. Toussaint sent a draft of this constitution to France for official confirmation. But Napoleon, alas, had never forgiven the Haitian warrior for his successful resistance to France. Instead, therefore, of honoring his suggestion, the French ruler sent an immense army of 60,000 men to the island to call on him to surrender. When Toussaint saw the fleet coming into the harbor, he knew resistance was useless and rushed to Cape Francois to tell his people not to take part in any opposition, which could avail them nothing. But he arrived there too late. His general, Christopher, had refused to let the white troops land, and the fighting was already on. Toussaint felt that he must, for loyalty's sake, join in, but the odds were too heavy, and he was forced to retreat. As it happened, both Toussaint's own son, Isaac, and his stepson, Placide, had been sent to France to complete their education. These these Napoleon had sent back with the fleet to Haiti, and they were now brought to their father by the French general, Leclerc, to urge him to surrender to France. Toussaint, who was both proud and just, told the boys to choose between him and their foster country. He would love them nonetheless, no matter what their decision. Strangely enough, Isaac, his own son, said, quote, You see in me a faithful servant of France who could never agree to take up arms against her. But Placide, who was bound to him by no tie of blood, but who owed all his position and training to him, exclaimed, quote, I am yours, father. I fear the future. I fear slavery. I am ready to fight to oppose it. I know France no more. I want to ask you guys a question in the chat. Again, this is a short paper, and I know it's, 
It's been extended through the commentary. But I have a question for you guys, the, the few of you who are here. What do you think is the cause for this distinction? I, I, I like to hear from Azuliism too. What's the cause of this distinction between two sons, blood relative, and his adopted kid or his stepkid? Right. What's the difference between these two kids? Same, same father figure, one connected by blood, one not by blood. Why the difference in outlook? I'm I'm real curious to hear from Bobby Wright, Mr. Untouchable, Azuliism, Marcus McGee, whoever else is here. Why the difference? Azuliism has a comment here from a, uh, a follow up to his last comment. He says Toussaint was in their army, so he was programmed, but he fought them. He had a severe case of cognitive dissonance. I, I would agree with that 100%. And that's something, again, we got to learn from that. We got to learn from that. The cognitive dissonance is real out here, even today. We got to learn from that. We got to learn from that. Right, but I'll be curious to hear from you guys. Why do you think same father figure, one actually related by blood, the other not related by blood? The one related by blood is is on the side of France. The other is like, boy, I fear slavery again. I will fight France. I don't give a damn about the French education I was getting, and these French people bringing me here. I would fight France. I'm curious to hear what you guys think is the main ingredient for that dichotomy. All right. Let me let me continue reading as you guys post that. And by the way, I well, I'll leave that one alone. Um, Isaac returned to Leclerc to tell him his father's and brother's decision. But Placidy stayed and fought at the head of a of a black battalion. He, he, you know, this is going to sound messed up. Even the fact that this kid was named Isaac is problematic for me. All right? To continue, it is sad to admit that Toussaint finally had to yield. He retreated to his home at uh, Gonevez, I guess. And even then, he might have lived out a peaceful and uh, comparatively happy existence. But summoned by a message, he visited unarmed and alone the house of a treacherous general called Brunet. Here he was seized, put in irons, placed on board the French man of war heroes, and taken with his wife and children to Brest. They never saw Haiti again. They never saw Haiti again. Azuliism is from Haiti. Azuliism, what's the story with Brunet? Or Brunet, or ho however you pronounce it, is is that name, is that name shit upon in Haiti? Right? Is that name shit upon in Haiti? What happened to this this treacherous general after he did this? I'm, I'm curious to know. To continue, he never lost his superb courage. He said to his captors, "Quote: In overthrowing me, you have only cut down the trunk of the tree of Negro liberty." Its roots will sprout again, for they are many in number and deeply planted. At the harbor of Brest in France, he made a final goodbye to his family and was, and was removed to Fort Joe on the edge of the Jura Mountains. Here he was placed in a deep dungeon, which in itself was fatal to, was fatal to a man used, used as he was to tropical light and sunshine. Used like, yeah, yeah, used as he was to tropical light and sunshine. He was very closely confined here. Every indignity heaped upon him, his faithful servant, Maro Placer, was taken from him. And finally, lest he should commit suicide, his watch and razor were removed. But this sort of insult meant nothing to that unvanquished spirit. Quote, I have been much misjudged, he said scornfully. I am thought to be lacking in courage 
to support my sorrow. For 18 months, he lingered on. Then one day, the governor of the prison took a holiday, leaving things in charge of Lieutenant uh, Colonel and hinting to him that if the, if the vulnerable Haitian were dead on his return, there would be no inquiries. It is pleasant to know that Colonel, far from responding to such a dastardly hint, took advantage of the governor's absence to give Toussaint coffee and other comforts which he had so long desired. The governor, finding on his return that his trick had not worked, took not long after another holiday. This time, he took the keys with him and left no one in charge, saying that everything had been attended to. He stayed away four days when he came back Toussaint lay in his cell dead from starvation. He died in 1803. But does it greatly matter if he had been asked, which do you think he would have preferred, life and ease or the implanting and fostering of the idea of liberty in the blacks of Haiti? No need to guess. His name lives on beyond his fondest dreams. Uh, Lamartine, the French poet, dramatized him. Auguste uh, Comte, the great philosopher, counts him among the 50 finest types of manhood in the world. All right? Our own Wendell Phillips in the oration, which all of you know, calls him soldier, statesman, and martyr. But best of all, his influence lives on. Woodsworth truly wrote to him, quote, Thou hast left behind powers that will work for thee, air, earth, and skies. There's not a breathing of the common wind that will forget thee. Thou hast great allies. Thy friends are exaltations, agonies, and love, and man's unconquerable mind. Toussaint Louverture did not die in vain, and his country was not destroyed after his death. The people of Haiti did not forget him, and he is their national hero to this day. Paper by John Henry Clark, African American historian. And that's the end of the paper. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me see if anyone answered my question. Uh, Erzulism answered, thankfully. He said, These kids really represented his cognitive dissonance. So, in one breath, he wants to fight France, and in the other, he is telling his son about the good part of the French society. Zulism goes on to say, Jean-Baptiste Brunet was a French general of division in the, in the Napoleon army. So he thinks he, he was in Haitian. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. 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 I, I'm curious as to why Toussaint was so trusting. If that was the case, right? Um, because how Clark presented it, uh, him as a treacherous general, I, I thought he was a general of, of, of Haiti. Um, but thank you for all that information, Erzuliism. I want to thank all of you for tuning in tonight. Shout outs to Erzuliism, Mr. Untouchable, Bobby E. Wright, KW Don Seven, Marcus McGee, and anyone else who had been here. Uh, in the backgrounds. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. I'll be back on the on the KWAZ radio YouTube channel on Thursday. Uh, I'll be doing another show that's about self-help. That's about uplift. I hope you guys come over and tune in. I'll be back again on Saturday for Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze. I think we have uh, some good topics, you know, set up for Saturday. Make sure to join the Discord. The link is pinned to the top of the chat. It's also down in the description. Join the Discord. Ask to be given a role up, upon upon landing. And um, you know, and then go to the Shoot the Breeze channel and you could post your topics as well. Right? Bobby Wright says great reading. I think that's a great way to end the show. Thank you for that comment. So I'll see you guys on Thursday and Saturday. You guys be good. Peace.
Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.